It is a brand new edition of Flyers Daily for Monday, the 18th of December. Flyers Daily, as always, presented by Ticketmaster. Make more memories live. Flyers will be back in action coming up tomorrow night when they take on the New Jersey Devils at the Prudential Center, looking to exact a little revenge. But it is a Monday, and joining us every Monday, you read his work on PhiladelphiaFlyers.com, NHL.com, and HockeyBuzz.com. It is Bill Meltzer. And Bill, since we last spoke, team is yet to lose. <laughs> they just keep <laughs> rolling right now. It's unbelievable. Yeah, for, oh, it, it, it is. Um, you know, the, the role the team is on, uh, with 6 0 2 in the last eight games, um, and finding different ways to win, too. Um, you know, that, that, that's something that you have to be able to do. You're not going to, it was one of the big issues a couple of weeks ago at this point was that the Flyers, if they didn't score first, hadn't won a game yet. Well, they, they've put that to bed because they've, they've come up with multiple wins now. Um, you know, when they've, when they trail or at least come up, come up with points from those games. Um, and, and I mean, that's really ultimately what a, what a team has to do. When you look at the teams at the top ends of the standings, inevitably those are teams that are even, even if they don't happen to score first that night, more often than not find ways to come away and win, or at least, at least take the game to overtime, get a point out of that game. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that, that that's kind of thankfully something we no longer have to bring up. Um, and you know, and, and last game to win a one nothing game, get the only goal in the first period. You got to make it. You got to make it stand up for a fifty four and a half minutes or so. Um, and and they did that. Uh, there, you know, there were a lot of shots in that game, but the Flyers did mostly a really good job of keeping the play to the perimeter. And whatever chances there were, um, could not have asked for a better game out of Sam Merson too. So. You know, well, that, that, that's that been another huge thing, too. No matter, no matter whether it's been Carter Hart or whether it's been Urson, Flyers goaltending gives him a chance to win every night, too. Yeah, and he's been unbelievable of late. We'll get to him more in a moment. Yeah. Uh, that, that's their second one nothing win of the season. The other one was the the one nothing shootout win where Erson battled Ilya Sorokin yeah. uh, through that shootout as well. Uh, but the Flyers, they come away with the win over Detroit one to nothing and uh, I, I guess you, the alarmist would go, well, they need to score more goals. Well, of course, but over this stretch, they've been, they have been scoring. And, yeah. and Bill, one of the things with this team, you know, we're 30 games in now. This is not a minute sample size anymore. This is pretty significant, albeit not an 82 game season. But this team's only lost three games one time this year. They've had back to back losses yeah. on three occasions, but they haven't strung together a really dreadful stretch in that, that three games was against Anaheim, Carolina, and Buffalo uh, way back at the end of October. Yeah, and, and those are those are games, too, that really could have gone either way. Going into the third period of every game, um, you know, games were, were tied or you're within, you know, within a goal in those games and were really competitive. And, and, and I mean, that, that's what you want. Every night to go out and feel like you, you have a chance to win. It, it was, those weren't disheartening losses where, you know, you go in, you're not competing, you fall way behind early, you know, and, and it just never feel like you're in the game. Flyers have really like had, only been one of those. That was Ottawa, say, right? I was just going to say that. Yeah. They, yeah. Really, really just the, the game is Ottawa. Even even the kind of ugly home loss to uh, to Anaheim was a game where Flyers really controlled a lot of the play, but they, you know, it was a game where they were giving up uh, a lot of transition goals. They, they would kind of be self-inflicted wounds, and they, they cleaned that up to – a large extent too. So, you know, I, I, I think that's, that's been a huge thing. And something else too has been, um, you know, I, I guess it's one of those cliches, but it's something the teams have to exhibit is that the next man up mentality lab last game, you don't have uh, Travis Sanheim. So we're still oh, and then moves up to the top pair. And I thought we still had maybe one of his best games as a flyer. Yeah. And, I thought it was third season here. So, you know, that's, um, I mean, you know, it's all positive. So, you know, when you you don't you don't put together stretches like these unless you're getting contributions from a lot of areas. Um, you know, a lot of young guys are young guys have stepped up in some of these games. Um, your your veteran core have been your tone setters, often, and uh, you know, and and just you know, also a shout out a shout out to, to Sean Couturier because not only is he playing 20 minutes a night every night, I mean, he's pretty banged up right now. Um, Got a got a little bit twisted up, uh, you know, on a on a play game before last, and um, that's why I you know yeah maintenance day and didn't, didn't do the morning skate. I don't think it was ever a question he was going to play in the game, um, 
you know, he went hobbling off, blocked a shot off his foot in that game. He just keeps on ticking, man. He just, he just keeps going. And, um, you know, the, just, just the, just the stability that he brings. Yeah. But also, you know, also what he just, uh, it, it's hard, it's hard to describe in words. I mean, a lot of it's intangible. You can look at all the underlying numbers he won and the offensive numbers. He put together that six game point streak and even the game when that ended scored in the shootout. Yeah. But, uh, but I just think having him back in that lineup, you can see the effect that's had on the team. I think that, that everything falls in place right underneath that. It all lines up for them much better. Yeah, the thing is with him, and Torts talked about this, uh, I think it was after uh, the Washington, or the uh, Detroit game, it's there's so many little plays that he makes. Yeah. You know, the really detailed plays. Maybe, maybe it's just, you know, knocking down a pass and then dumping it and getting a change. Like, it could be as yeah. minute as that. It seems like not much, but if he doesn't do that, you get hemmed in the zone. You could get scored on. You could take a penalty, get scored on the path. Like the, the trickle down effect of the little plays that he makes are very, very pronounced. And I agree with you. I, I'm a firm believer. I was talking to Bundy about this on the pregame show before the Detroit game. That slotting in sports is so important. And he just helps slot things better. That being said, Ryan Paling has been the second or third line center. That's probably not the right slot for him long term. Um, but Bill, you know, Ristolainen, he moves up to that top pair because Travis Sanheim is ill. Um, Erickson gets the three straight starts because Carter Hart's dealing with some illness. And th- these players are really stepping up. Uh, were you surprised that it was Ristolainen that went to the top pair? I thought, you know, Sanheim's out. Let's not mess everything up because yeah. one guy's out. Let's yeah. move one guy up. Let's leave our known commodity with Walker and Sealer in the middle. And they've been really good. And, and that's something you can bank on. And let's see if Risto can go up to that top pair, fill that void, play with some guardrails on. But he not only did that, but he played incredibly physically too, but didn't take himself out of plays. No, um, that, so. yeah, that, that's been, I mean, really, really since maybe last December, maybe, you know, for about the last calendar year, he did miss, of course, time in the start of the season. That's really been the biggest change with Risto Linen is that, you know, playing hard, playing physical, blocking shots, hitting. But not playing recklessly, not taking himself out of position to get that big hit, and then he can't get back. Um, that's been been a huge difference with him, um, you know. And I, I think that in, in a couple of these bigger games this season have been some of his better games. I agree. Um, so I, you know, I, I think that's really, really been a, a positive thing with him too. Um, yeah, and and, and and as you just touched on, you want to have as much continuity as possible. So you don't want to shake up all three pairings if you can if you can possibly avoid doing that. And they and they also want to keep Cam York on the left, so they needed a, a natural right side guy. So so it didn't surprise me that Ristolainen had slotted up. And also, don't forget for most of his career, um, and maybe when we talk about slotting, it's not the ideal place to slot him. But for much of his career, he'd been a twenty minute a night guy. Yeah. Um. So he he's used to handling the the heavy ice time burden and the difficult matchups. I mean, listen, you know, long-term and it's, it's just an illness issue with, with Sanheim and they can get their pairings back to, to where they were before, um, you know, moving forward here, but uh, the ability to be able to do that, to be able to be able to have him come in and, and step up big uh, in a, you know, in a game where they really could have used that. I mean, that that's a huge thing. We talk about the importance of depth, that's what it is. Um, the ability to – we've talked about where Scott Lawton is a guy. You know, maybe he's not ideally uh, a, a top center, but he, he can fill in on the top end or you can move him to a wing, you play him in the fourth line. Having that having that versatility where you can slide guys up if you have to and, and then, then go back to maybe a more ideal deployment. I mean, that's that's something the Flyers have not had – have not had that in a number of years. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I think for the most part this team – Pretty well does have that. You know, they're, they could use more depth down the middle and maybe a little bit more high end down the middle. Um, you know, whether, you know, well, just, just regardless, Couturier, you know, um, Frost brings you, you know, the, the offensive side of it. But, um, you know, but I, I think to have that ideal kind of second line center, I mean, that, that would be, that'd be something, I guess, maybe down the road here. But you have guys that can fill in in that 
two, three. Because I, I kind of think the fire second and third lines are a little bit interchangeable as the yeah. what you call the two, what you call the three. It's kind but, of semantics. Um, yeah. So, you know, uh, but but I mean, you know, ideally, you know, you go but go back to the years uh, the Flyers don't have this. It, it would be, you know, it, it, when you think of the very best Flyers teams through history, right? The the best teams in Flyers history, they had, um, you know, Lindros Brindamore is the one-two punch down the middle. Mm-hmm. Um, or, or before that, they had Clark and McLeish is the one-two punch down the middle. This team doesn't have that. But they, but they do have some depth. They have the ability to throw some different stuff at you and, and some versatility too. So they, you know, they can work around. I think that would be that'd be the next step up for the team to, you know, to, to, where, to where they could hopefully get to as they re, as they continue on the rebuild. Yeah, we'll see if you know Mishkov when he comes over if he's going to be a center or yeah. or Cutter Gauthier as well. We'll see how that plays out and and how they kind of adapt to the North American or the in. Gauthier's case, just the, the professional game, although he did play in the Worlds and played very well. He was on the wing there, though, I believe. Nice. Um, and, but being able to weather the storm when a, a player's out with illness or a player's out injured uh, is an, indeed a big thing. Bill Erson, um, in his last nine games, he's 7-1. and one. I mean, he got off to a horrific start. He has 760 save percentage in his first three yeah. games. I mean, that is not good. That's lower than beer league numbers. Um, but since 7-1-1, one and one, He's allowed 17 goals on 244 shots. He got 227 saves. How about a 930 save percentage? Two shutouts, two one nothing wins. Uh, he's been lights out in overtime and shootouts this year. And I mean, this guy has got just confidence right now, just oozing out of him. And you know, some teams around the league, Bill, are looking for one guy that can stop some pucks. The Flyers have got two guys right now yeah. that can stop some pucks. And I. The ability to have a, a second goalie who if your your first guy either goes down or you're facing a back to back or you know all, all the various things that happen during the season. You know, I, I'm not gonna throw Felix Sanchum under the bus, but last year that was part of the Flyers record. You know, they they struggled in games that Felix started. Um part of it was he didn't get a, a ton of goal support. Uh, he got a lot of hard games, the second side of back to backs, but you know uh, the the bottom line of it too was that Felix was kind of prone to that one bad goal a game. Yeah, and you know it, it's going to happen to every goalie sometimes, but it, it happened a little too much, I think. Sometimes in Felix with regularity. Yeah, yeah. And, and I said it was pretty much pretty much every start. There'd be one you go back and nah, that's one he could have or should have had, and. In a league with so many close games, and for a team that that um, you know, still you know the the offensive side is a little bit scratching and clawing for your goals, and so some days some days it'll flow, but but a lot of games you're going to have to really work for the goals that you do get. Um, that you know that'll that'll really sink your record if you just just that one bad goal could will totally change a game around a lot of times, and that's it's nothing against Felix or to say that he couldn't work through it, but. Uh, but the thing thing with Urson is that he hasn't had to. He he's played on a higher level, and that that's also translated to the team. Yeah, it really has. Let's get to some uh, ask Billy questions. I put the tweet out. Thirty games into the NHL season, the Flyers have stunned a lot of people. So I said, drop some questions here for a special Ask Billy episode, uh, Flyers Daily, and uh, Bill and I will get to as many as possible. Let's start out with this one from Isaiah from OMB Puck. He says, would it make sense for the Flyers to bring in a low-cost vet center who can help cut back Couturier's minutes for when the Flyers are really contending? It seems pretty clear that Torts doesn't think that player is on the roster. Even just two minutes a game could mean a lot two years from now. Um, As far as the you know, a, a low cost vet center. I mean, you have Ryan Paling on a one year deal. You have uh, Noah Cates when he does return will hopefully shed some minutes from Couturier as well, provided Cates can come back healthy. But um, I don't think they're really in the market to go out and and find a low cost vet center. Well, um, you know, you I guess you could look at what's available as, as you move a little bit along. I, I, I do agree. I do agree with Isaiah about this though, that I do worry about Katori playing 20 minutes. I do night too. Night. Yeah, and, I see a little more balance in the distribution of minutes. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I'm not concerned about it right now, 
but I am concerned about him kind of being gassed by the stretch. Mm-hmm. And then if he, and then a know, couple of years from now, like you can't just keep. And, I mean, and then yeah, and, and, and you know, now now that he's in his thirties, you have to take care of him a little bit because mm-hmm. he, he means so much to the team. I think you need to you need to manage that. You, you can't keep burning the candle at both ends, so to speak. I I, I do think that that is a, a very fair concern. Um, you know, uh, when when Cates comes back, I mean, we'll we'll see how the lines shake out. I I like the wing. I'd, I'd like, like to see him back on the wing too. I, like I agree. To see, yeah, and yeah. you know, uh, I think that um, you know, I I think Scott Lawn is still a capable player. I I mean, actually, during the during that road trip, the the three game trip, I think part of the issue was that Scotty was playing twenty minutes a night. Yeah, you know, and that that's because Paling wasn't available. So you know, Frost was getting a little extra ice time, about fifteen minutes a night. But really, the a lot of that gap was made in by continuing to burn the candle at both ends with Couturier and, and Lawton's workload being increased. You look at, you look at that trip, he was playing 18, 20 minutes a night every game. I think, I think that's one of the reasons, truthfully, why Lawton was one of the guys kind of struggling for energy in, in that first game back off the trip because yeah. he played a lot of hard minutes. And, um, you know, sometimes after a trip, it takes you know, veteran guys a, a game or two to get going. Um, and, and we've said before that, that – uh, you know, I, I don't think I don't think Lawton is ideally used on the upper end of the lineup. So, I mean, if if there were such a center out there for low cost or for a rental or something, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't be opposed to it. But it, it's just a question of you know who's available and whatever. Especially in light of the fact that and, and Danny Breer has made clear that the plan itself has not changed. So they're yeah. um, they're not really looking to be to be buyers right now. So but but as a long term issue, hundred percent agree. It's something they need to need to think about. Yeah, I'd I'd rather distribute those minutes to Morgan Frost to to further see his game and also, yeah. you know, I mean, I think we kind of know what paling is, but I I don't want to bring in a center and then all of a sudden Frost is on the outside looking in again no, because sure. the GM just acquired a guy, you know, yeah, that's, sure. that's one thing that that's a volatility that I don't, I don't have an appetite for. Um, Vinny tweets in, he says uh, he has two questions. Um, let's get to his question two first. He said, if Johnny hockey, Johnny Gaudreau is available, does it make sense for the flyers to try and get him? Um, that's an emphatic hell no. <laughs> Why would <laughs> I mean nine point seven five? He's in year two of the seven year deal. He's got five goals, twelve assists, and thirty two games. Um, no, there's no appetite for Johnny Hockey. But his other question is actually a decent one. Uh, Vinit says, uh, with the eventual arrival of Michkov as right wing one and the development of Forster and Brink along with Tumala in Lehigh, what should the Flyers' approach for extensions be for Travis Konechny and or Owen Tippett? It's an interesting question because yeah. you are in a rebuild now. Both play Konechny's a little older than Tippett, but Tippett is twenty four, so he's part of your future. Uh, but how do they approach these extensions, Bill? Yeah, and and Tippett is still in those restricted free agent years. Arb eligible, right? Yeah, yeah, the, he, he's arbitration eligible now. Um, so you you know you have you have to. I think you have to keep your eyes open about it. Um, you know, Kinecki's a little bit different because he's so central to the team. You know, um, I don't know. I, I you know, I, I I don't think you I don't think you ever say no to moving a player for the right the right price. Um, and it's nothing about the player; it's just about your your inner rebuild. You know, to uh, I'm not saying I'm not saying the Flyers have another Travis Kinecki they can just plug in the lineup. I don't say Tua Ball is going to come in and, and be. Connect me, but I but I am saying that when you can, you're in a position of strength and you have some depth. That's where you can do some things. That's where you can you can fill other holes in a team. Um, uh, the, you know, it's, it's always. I think the Flyers are they're not out of the phase yet where you want to collect assets, but I think they're as long as these other players keep developing, you can move to a, a phase where you're maybe trading off some of some positions of strength to be able to add things that you need, you know, at the NHL level I'm talking about. Yeah. So, you know, I, I mean, I, I think that connect me right now. Ultimately, I think he is a guy you want to extend long-term. Um, 
you know, and I, I don't see anything imminently about to change that. With Tippett, I, I want to see Tip take that next step, yeah. right? I, I want to see Tip go from, you know, scored 27 last year, and this year actually, it, it's funny. You know, one of the things when you look at Tip's season last year, when you really break his numbers down, um, you know, it's, it's one of the things that gets thrown at Frost fairly, I might add. I think it's a fair criticism that, that – if you look at who his points were distributed against, maybe too much of it was against non-playoff teams. Same thing's true of Tip, though. Uh, of Tip's 27 goals last year, I, I did the numbers, right? Two-thirds of them were, um, when you add in two empty net goals against against playoff, playoff teams, two-thirds of them were either against non-playoff teams or empty net goals, right? So it's, it's the same thing. I, but, you know, you, you see that in other sports, too. You know, it, it's like saying, oh, well, you know, this hitter only beats up on bad pitching or bad teams. Well, you play those teams, too. Everybody plays them. Yeah. So, you know, you have, you have, to, you have to win the games that are in front of you. But I but I would like to see, before you commit really long-term to a guy like Tippett, just I want to see him be a, uh, you know, be An one alpha. of those guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> be, be, a game. Charge, be, yeah. A, be a Be a take charge kind of player. Uh, mm. In big games, who will be that guy who steps up? Um, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, when Mike Yell was the coach before, um, before Torts came in, um, it was the towards the end of the year, and just very candid, very you know, it was a very relaxed conversation uh, with the, the media people, and and you know, Yell was very upfront, and one of the things he said that he wanted to see, he liked what he was seeing. Um, that's when they had that line uh, with Cates and Tippett and Frost. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he said at that time that one of the things he wanted to see with Morgan and with Owen is that when things things are going good for the team and things are clicking with the team, they fall right on in and they step up and, you know, contribute. But when, when they were having sometimes games where it wasn't going the team's way, um, or, you know, which happens a lot of times, particularly when you're against those top teams, the playoff teams, you have to kind of weather the storm a little bit. Um, if somebody else took the lead, they could follow in with it, yeah. but they weren't, yeah, but they weren't yet the guys that were going to carry the torch and, and lead you in those situations. I mean, I, I think it still is a fair criticism to, to a degree when, when things are going well with the team, they can play really well, really, really well. Um, you know, when you, when you go into the to the really tough buildings, you know who are going to be the guys who step up and lead you. Um, it it's been connecting. It certainly has been Couturier. Yeah, you know I I would like to see more of that from from guys like Tippett and from Frost. Um, and again, Tippett is, Tippett actually this year has been scoring a little bit against, against better teams too. A little, little hot and cold, a little bit inconsistent, but but it's there. But I I want to see how. The rest of this plays out before you're, you know, before you're discussing long-term contracts. Yeah, before I'm talking cool. seven years. Yeah, but bef- yeah. yeah, I, I, I want to see him become a tone setter for the team, and not yeah. just the particular number of goals in a year, but but being one of those go-to guys. And if he can do that, then you certainly look to extend them. Yeah, I mean, I, I think when you, when you see his conf- and he's a confident player, you see him uh, dictating the terms yeah. everywhere he's at on the ice. Um, yeah. But we just need to see that with more consistency. Um, starting to see a little bit of the creativity come back a little bit with him, too. He had a really yeah. incredible spin move uh, the other night against Detroit. Um, Tom Seconder tweets in and he says, are the Flyers still sellers at the deadline? He said, my opinion is it's obviously no longer a fire sale, but you still need to acquire assets for the expiring deals like Walker and Sealer. Um, well, the second part of that, it was never going to be a fire sale. Yeah. They were never stripping it down to the studs um, and going to, you know, go full scorched earth and, you know, put a new foundation and all that stuff. That was never going to happen. Um, but are they still sellers at the deadline? I mean, the deadline's not until March 8th. <laughs> yeah. We've got a long time to the deadline. Matter of fact, I put it in my countdown clock, Billy. The other day, I'm like, you know, there's so much talk about what are the Flyers going to do at the deadline? So I figured I'd put it in my countdown clock. It's 80 days from now. The NHL trade line. So we got a lot of runway before we yeah. get there. Um, but I think it's pretty clear. And I, I don't think the message has ever changed from Torts, Danny Briere, or Keith Jones. And I know Keith Jones and Danny Briere were out there with some public availabilities saying that nothing has changed. Yeah. Winning is good, but it doesn't change the rebuild and long term vision. 
No, for sure. I I think the most any, anything that might change therein, you know, and they, as you said, it's eighty days. A lot a lot is going to happen between now and then. Um, I, I think that a I think where the decision making comes in is if you're you're there and um, you know you, you're getting offers on guys. I mean, listen, the Flyers would have no problem dealing Walker. They have no problem dealing Sealer. It comes. It comes to a point where okay, what what's available? What are the offers looking like? Um, you know, there's a certain point where you you have to put you have to weigh the rebuild against you know where the team is right now. Um, there's a possibility to go. You know what? We're, we're getting round pick offers for. The physicality that he brings. You know, the, st- the stability that he's that he and, and Walker brought together, we're just going to ride it out, and we'll see in the office. So there might be, a, be almost a stand pat point where you're not getting, you're not getting offer that you're going to play on. This is this is an offer we can't say no to. Um, you know, um, but you know, maybe, maybe it does come in where teams are lined up, you know, where they're bidding against one another, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you have a First round pick in the offense for a guy who wouldn't typically bring a first round offer, and maybe you go. You know what? We we have to act on it now because that's a deal we can't say no to. Uh, so I, I mean, standing pat, you know, or, or just, you know, you're being being a minor seller. If somebody somebody makes you an offer, you uh, and you can justify that to the room. I say, listen, you know, a lot of value here, you know. What we're doing, it, it has nothing to do with the team mix or whatever. Um, but you know, but it, but it's something that's part of the long term rebuild. But and I short of that, but but short of that, Jason, I think that chemistry is a delicate thing on the team. Yeah, and you don't want to upset it too much, and you have you have to weigh what the assets are. I I, I think a couple mid round picks are not worth disrupting chemistry over the way the team's playing. Yeah, they go, oh, I'm going to give you a third-round pick for player X. I go, okay, what are the chances that third-round pick is a guy that plays 200 NHL games? Yeah. It's probably around 5%. Right. So is it really worth taking that away for the chance at a player at 5%? It, it does, that, that's the, the cost uh, you know, kind of equation that you have to, to look at, too. I, I know people in sports, they, they love draft picks, Billy. Oh, they love mm-hmm. draft because we're going to pick the next Braden Point or we're going to pick the next Nikita Kucherov or, you know, they just love picks. Yeah. I've always been more of a, you know, I love known commodities. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'm, I have a fear of the unknown. That's me. Uh, but I digress. Now, let's get to this question. This comes from a notorious PIG. He says, it seems that the Flyers are scoring more off the rush this season. Is this backed up by numbers? Or is this a recency bias, especially due to the shorthanded offense? Um, well, they do have seven shorthanded goals, which leads the NHL. But are they scoring more off the rush? Uh, absolutely, they are. Yeah. I don't know the exact numbers. I did a big deep dive on all the underlying numbers and advanced stats on the team in an episode a couple of days ago. And everything was good, except for the power play. It was hideous. But, um, but they are scoring way more off the rush. And... I don't know that it's just as simple, Bill, as they're getting more opportunities off the rush, which they clearly are. But I think it's just the way they attack off the rush, which such fast transition from turnover, stop a play in the D zone and get right on it. That is making all the difference in the world. I think it's upping the quality of those off the rush opportunities. No question. No question. And the activating defensemen. Sean Walker has been phenomenal. That's by the right. way. Yeah. Walker and, and uh, Sandheim and, and York ever increasingly yeah. too. Um, that's been one of the biggest areas of improvement. Uh, you know, talk about the Flyers transition game and that, that's where a lot of these chances on the rush are coming. Um, and not that's not, you know, not just odd man rushes, but I mean, sometimes you're starting your own into the ice, but, but a clean breakout pass. Now all of a sudden you're. Oh, um, you know, the, and, and some games, you know, like the, the first game back off the break, that was a very, um, 
then then and then the the last game, the um, against Fires can, Fires have shown they can play with pace. Um, we've talked before about how the puck moves faster than anybody can skate. It's that that outlet pass, or sometimes having the trailer come up on the play. Um, you know, they can make a huge difference too. The Flyers do all of those things significantly better. Um, and Walker has been been a huge, huge part of that. And, and and Sandheim being more aggressive in yeah, triggering decisive. those plays and joining those plays, they, they, those have been huge. So, so it's not just it's not just an illusion that the, the Flyers are generating more chances and scoring more off the rush. The numbers back it up too. Boy, York to me looks like a player that we're starting to go. Okay, yeah, th- this is this is developing into the player we had hoped he would. It's just yeah. so calm. Like he scores the goal, the only goal. In the Detroit game, we thought it was Couturier's, but he ends up getting it. He had another great scoring chance where he drives the net hard and tries to wrap to the far post, uh, unable to get that one. But the play I thought that was his best play of the game was um, the play off the rush where he defended. <laughs> I mean, yes. oh yeah, his balance on his, you know, his skating, he's so balanced that he can do things with his body because he's so under control. Yeah, for, uh, for sure. And quick stick to. You know, so you know, I mean, a lot, he, he throws a lot of plays before they even really develop. You know, um, you know he's uh, he can control his body, and and he has the quick stick too. So a lot, a lot of things that just look like you know, they really don't develop in anything. They they didn't develop anything because how well defended it was on, on the front end, and. Boy, he's taking a jump there. He, he, he's done. He's doing so so much you know, so much in those situations. Um, I think that's part of why Toro was saying, you know, when he was asked about the offense, he pumped the brakes a little bit. We didn't want him to lose the defensive side. I you know, and the, the coach is the coach talking. They begin to worry about that sometimes, particularly veteran veteran. I, I honestly think that the he he found. What works for him defensively, and now he's adding offense into it. Bill, he's a top pairing defenseman at 22 years of age, and uh, you know, I mean, he's on that top pair night in, night out, dealing with the toughest lines in hockey too. So it's been so impressive. All right, let's wrap it up there. Uh, let's uh, let everybody know that they can read Bill's work at PhiladelphiaFlyers.com, NHL.com, and HockeyBuzz.com. We thank everybody who tweeted in great questions for yet another rousing edition of Ask Billy. And we'll be back tomorrow. We'll preview Flyers Devils as the Flyers look to exact a little revenge. This point streak started back on November 30th against the Devils. So we'll see if they can uh, get a win coming up tomorrow night. So join us then on a brand new episode of Flyers Daily.